Brought to you by Moonbeam Multimedia. This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. Welcome to 2023. Yeah. We made it. We did. We made it. Another rotation around the sun. If the start of this year is an indication for the length of the year. Ah. Not feeling super positive. You're not. You don't have a good feeling yet. I feel like all we've gotten is bad news Uh, this past week. mm. And I returned to school. You did. After today. We're recording this on your after after your first day back. Yeah, so not quite two weeks mm-hmm. of break. Mm-hmm. And a science teacher above me, one of their sinks, or like the piping, froze, uh-huh. burst, mm. trickled down, economied into my classroom, and <laughs> ruined a set of books yeah. that were not mine. Kate sent me a, uh, a <sighs> video this morning of her p- like squishing down on the top of a pile of books, and water just came like... Gushing. Dripping out of the pages. Mm-hmm. So my day was spent trying to figure out what I'm going to do for a week without a class set of books. That you were actively teaching That from. I was in the middle of. Mm-hmm. Telling the rest of my kids not to touch the books and not to touch anything over there because it's all sticky. And I don't know why it's sticky because it was supposed to just be water, but it's sticky. That's disgusting. Running the dehumidifier, running the air purifier, and my classroom is freezing. So it's no longer sweltering. Now it's Which freezing. Which is good, because I don't think mold will grow if it's too cold for life to <laughs> inhabit it. So <laughs> I think that's how science works. Yeah, yeah, sounds like this might be to your advantage. I had a student come down the hallway and go, "Is it smell your room? And I was like, well, probably. <laughs> Ew. Because it can't be no. <laughs> right? That's really gross. So. Well, that's unfortunate. How's your 2023? How about, we, how about we just say that we got all of the bad out of the way on the first day of school, and okay. now the rest of your year is going to be awesome. Cool. Cool. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm looking for the bright side. Remind me of that tomorrow morning at like 7.15 mm-hmm. a.m. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually, this is, um, listeners, this might be something that you also have, but I have like first day of school jitters, and it applies also to returning from break. Mm-hmm. So, like, the night after a break, like, this break specifically, I cannot sleep. Yeah. The first week I get back to school, I cannot sleep. Anxious, all of these things. But I'm, like, so afraid of sleeping in mm-hmm. on accident mm-hmm. that I think I just stress so hard that I'm like, well, I can't sleep because then what if I don't wake up? And then that only makes it worse. I can't worse. sleep because what if I don't wake up? So, this morning, I was, like, laying in bed and the alarm went off, like, 5.30. And I was like, okay. I checked the Duncan's. They open at five. I was like, tempting. And then I thought, no, I got four hours of sleep tomorrow. I will get myself out of bed with the reward of Duncan. I think that's my only hope. Okay. So if anybody wants to Venmo me at Teachers Run on Duncan, Katie is broke at Venmo.com <laughs> shop. Dot Zell. Dot Zell. Dot <laughs> PayPal. Dot. <laughs> My drink is like $4.16, no pressure. There you go. Okay. So that's how 2023 has started. Okay. I I think I should probably be a little more positive. What about you? You're wearing a Book It hat right now, which feels important. I am. I'm wearing we a have, Book It hat. That's an episode. We did an episode on Book It, yes. We found this uh, custom hat d- designer, manufacturer, mm-hmm. or whatever they are, and you can pick a patch and yeah. put it on the hat. And we were going, there are thousands of patches that we found, and we I found a book it one. It's great. It's a beautiful hat. So now I just have this ridiculous giant purple book it patch on it's the front of my hat. It's such a distinct color. Yeah. I actually forgot what that purple was like mm-hmm. until I saw it, and I was like, oh my gosh. It's like 1992 purple. It smells like Pizza Hut. What's the, uh, what's the McDonald's character who's purple? Grimace. Grimace? It's like Grimace purple. <laughs> Isn't he the purple one? I think so. Oh. 
Um, so is your 2023 better than mine? It's so going fine so far. Good. Good. I mean, there's it, it's a busy time. There's a it lot is. going on. Everybody just got back into the office and is scrambling from the week, the <laughs> work they didn't do over the past two weeks. So I sent you a, a meme on Twitter. Did you see it? Mm -hmm. And it was a picture of Big Bird, like surrounded by humans, like looking around like, oh, God, what do I do? And it was like everyone returning to work today. And I after I saw that, I was like, I was Big Bird. Mm hmm. Me trying to remember what I do for a living. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll include the link to that tweet in the show notes because it's a great image of Big Bird. Just like, what? <laughs> okay. Well, that's our update. Yeah. We uh, had this a couple... This is all we do now, right? <laughs> this is just, we just buy? We just... <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had a couple of fun episodes over the holidays. If you haven't listened to those yet, go listen to them. They're kind of cute. They're sort of like little personal manifestos about... Education and learning. Um, you did one a love letter to teaching, and mine was a love letter to learning. I think we were... should do those more often. Yeah, it was a fun way to. We we wanted to take a little bit of time off, so we did shorter, shorter little personal episodes, and it was a fun. It was kind of fun. I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't mind. Doing I think that. there's plenty of other topics we could tackle. Probably that way. Probably that might so. be nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's very weird mm -hmm. to do it alone. It's weird when you're used to talking to somebody else to just sit and talk yeah. into a microphone. Nice show. Yeah. Those were so nice. thanks for hanging out with us. Check out those episodes. But now we are getting back into the normal swing of things. Uh, what are we talking about this week? Education content creation. Yeah. Content. We're talking about content. I feel like that's a buzzword of the past few years. Content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It almost, it's a word that almost makes me cringe because it's just so, I mean, people usually are using it ironically. Like or, content. Or and then just they fall off condescendingly. Or yeah. Because content and content creation, so much of it is commercialized and kind of gross and whatever. But within the wide world of content creation, there is a lot of content that is created specifically content. content. Content counter. Content. We should, you should make a little ding sound How many every times time. Gonna count the word <laughs> yeah. content. Yeah. There is a, a sort of subset of content creation <laughs> that is specifically and explicitly for educational purposes. And uh -huh. we're going to talk a lot about that today um, because we spend a lot of time consuming it. You spend a lot of time sharing it with your students in your classroom. I uh, do. Well, I don't mean like a lot. It's, it's not like the only thing you do, but, you know, you have some really good resources that you... I'm a content uh, machine. You're a content mill. So anyway, no, we're going to kind of dive into some really interesting resources and examples of people who are doing good work just to inform and to educate. There are a lot of ways in which the internet is melting our brains right now, but I'm a big fan of exploring the kind of good and useful parts of the internet and educational content is is one of those things you definitely prefer that part of the internet and i definitely prefer the dumpster fire part the dumpster fire that's my favorite part of the internet dumpsters only dumpsters are us uh i no, want to feel I, comfortable <laughs> uh i'm a i'm i'm a purveyor of fine dumpster fires every now and then i i Perfect. seek them i seek them out and occasionally create them okay uh, okay. But no, for, yeah, for the most part, I like to try to spend a lot of time on the more wholesome parts of the internet, yeah. because if I don't, it just hurts my mental health. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Meanwhile, yeah. I'm fueled. I am by fueled by hate and rage. I am, but just Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, what is it exactly? What is content creation? What is this umbrella yeah. term? I mean, we're... We all live within it pretty much 24-7 now, but it's the process of making information available to a wide audience, usually digitally through the internet um, these days, although I'm sure somebody could make a case for non-digital content creation, but I'm not sure whether that... I think content creation is usually considered to be mm. happening on the internet. We love a good flyer. <laughs> a flyer. Yeah, I guess a flyer <laughs> is content. Content. Um... So, you know, writing articles, blogs, news organizations, videos, photography, articles, podcasts, much like this one. Oh. We are content When creators. I wrote that on the notes, I put a big smiley face. Smiley face. Um, you know, we also have, like, ads, promotions, social media posts kind of that get lumped into the uh, same realm as content creation. It's sort of adjacent to it, but that's more specifically for commercial or advertising purposes. But all of that is part of the content creation industry. Who does this kind of stuff? Who 
are the content creators. Almost anyone with an internet connection. Y- yeah, yeah. That's uh, so. <laughs> Was that a trick question? <laughs> no, it really isn't. <laughs> Pretty much anyone who has an internet connection can create content. You too can create content. And uh, you get a content, and I, you get some content. I actually do want to make a slight, a slight plug. I'm a big fan of of indie web projects, which means I, I am a big fan of projects where people retain ownership of their content and can control it and decide what is to be done with it. So I'm a big fan of personal websites, for example. Like, I have a personal website, it's and great. I'm a web developer, so that makes a lot more sense for me. But I have a personal website where I blog and share things and create links to whatever the heck I want that I find interesting on whatever day. It's like an ADHD repository for all of my distractions. Can we plug what you're going to be doing this year on your personal oh, website? Yeah, my personal. I think this is cool. I mean, yeah, this is a bit of content creation. I'm going to, I think I'm going to set up a little bookshelf area on my personal website. Just code up a little project where I'm hoping that I can make it kind of automatic where I can do something like scan a barcode or an ISBN and have it pull in information. But I want to have just a little kind of visual progress tracker, something along the lines of Goodreads, uh, but on my own website Mm -hmm. where I can... That you do. Yeah, that I do and that I maintain and that I can update when I want and I don't have to worry about Goodreads locking me out of my own reading progress, which is, again, with the Twitter implosion that has been happening, that kind of event is is a good chance for some introspection on ownership of our own content and because places like Twitter can just disappear at any time because of any maniacal owner Mm -hmm. (laughs) taking charge because of that it's a good idea to have your content hosted on your own web server and syndicated to these other kinds of services so anyway that's my own personal blog as a dweeb a web developer dweeb but yeah i want to set up this own little my own little personal bookshelf to uh keep track of my reading goals yeah and there are other places obviously too there are like traditional orgs and other companies that do this kind of thing other than just the wee baby personal websites that exist out in the world. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we're going to talk about this more, but a lot of these resources that we're going to be reviewing, they all post content on places like YouTube and things like that, but almost all of them have also have their own uh, websites. Yeah. And just the reason, again, the reason for that is when you put content on these platforms, a lot of times, first of all, you become part of the product. <laughs> and second of all, you lose control and sometimes you can have things go wrong. If you make a livelihood from content creation, a flip of a switch or some, some machine learning thing flags your content for some reason. And now you can't make a living that way anymore. There are a lot of, a lot of interesting things to consider here, but, or if everyone gets locked out of Facebook for hours, you know, things just happen. Things just, if, yeah, if they physically lock themselves out of the building. I mean, we have seen content creators, on one social media pleading for their other account on mm-hmm. whatever their money making thing is mm-hmm. to be unblocked or unbanned and sometimes it just happens with no reason yeah like seemingly no reason yeah and it's just a button somewhere that you know somebody or maybe didn't even hit mm-hmm. but something happens and so i wasn't aware of that like consumerism That, like, gets wrapped up in, I'm going to talk about social media specifically, but you were, like, the first person who kind of, like, made me aware about that stuff. And I remember you telling me that when you use a free product that you are... Yeah, your data is what's being bought and sold Right, so, like, you are the good Mm -hmm. that is being (laughs) sold. To advertise. Because I might use a social media platform for free, but I have given them this information and that's what makes the money is, like my use Mm -hmm. and I'd never I mean I knew that that happened but not like in any sort of way that made sense to me so now applying it in the terms of content creation has just been really interesting because here are people using a lot of platforms at times right other than a personal website um, in which to be holding to something else to make a living Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we I think we talked about this even during COVID was There was like that big, the big TikTok bubble burst that happened. And it's because the people at first were making a ton of money because TikTok pays out of a pot, a set pot every month. Mm -hmm. And so these content creators were... Static creator fund pool. Yeah. yeah, So these creators were making big money in TikTok those first six months of COVID when it really, you know, went out of control. They quit their jobs And then the money changed. And it's because there was thousands and thousands and millions of more creators than there had been. 
So. Yeah. It's I interesting. Mean, we haven't solved all, all of the problems inherent to all of this because part of the reason why the big platforms are attractive to content creators is because those platforms provide a discoverability engine that helps them reach the people they want to reach. So the trade-off there is that sometimes it can be more difficult to reach people when you do things like host on a personal website yeah. or whatever it is. Not um, the same. But there are a lot of, there are a growing number of uh, indie web and sort of federated, federated uh, is a term that we're starting to hear more of because of <laughs> Mastodon's rise post Twitter blow up. Um, Mastodon being a kind of federated version of something sort of like Twitter, uh, where individual servers are owned by individual server admins and are connected to all the other servers that exist through these protocols that are kind of interesting. Called uh, Activity Pub is the one that kind of connects Mastodon. But anyway, huh. uh, yeah, the concept there is that each server is controlled by a you know a small smaller entity and not not being controlled by a giant corporate monolith who has absolute control but rather uh we have this sort of community of networks rather than one big platform network so anyway there's a lot of interesting stuff happening there i obviously get going and don't shut up about it but big fan of owning your own content so yeah, that aside, I think we're going to dive into this a little bit because there's so much interesting, I don't know, there's just a lot of interesting stuff going on. Yeah. There are so many hours of fascinating things to to consume and so much of it is educational and like I said, I'm just a big fan of talking about those things when possible because so much of what's bad about the internet tends to drown out so much of what's good about the internet and uh, being a fan of the internet, generally speaking, I like to try to highlight the good. So... Back to who does this. That's what we were kind of everyone. talking about. Yes, everyone can. Everyone who has an internet connection can create content and put it on the internet. But we see a lot of traditional orgs and companies and such. We get, you know, like news and media organizations, mm -hmm. colleges, universities, think tanks, that kind of thing. They put out a lot of stuff. Um, companies, governments, artists and writers. These are typically entities who create content for the web and we have big platforms like we just talked about for all this content creation we've got like um, news websites youtube tiktok instagram uh, and then just websites so yeah but also you know any any kind of digital resource that is created for the purpose of sharing information so i think most of this discussion we're going to have is going to be on several of these examples of content mm -hmm. that are helpful for probably helpful for classroom purposes yeah um because we again we want to focus on the sort of educational content so yeah, yeah so i i was kind of i was actually kind of fun coming up with this list because i was doing the like is this content is this not and some of them weren't even though i weren't content well not in the way that this kind of works mm. um i, I think it was educational, but it wasn't it, content. It was. And content. the hard part for me is that content to me means one thing, and to you it's totally different. Mm, and mm -hmm. so for me, I'm like, well, that is content, because that's what I teach. Well, there's um. certainly content <laughs> in those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but content creation specifically right. as the industry is what we're focusing yep. on. So, yeah. So we just kind of came up with a list of things that either I've used or Chelsea's familiar with, and finally giving credit to a website we have probably cited a dozen times and haven't talked about yet. So start at the top. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing, Ted and Ted Ed, of course. Yeah. Which we can throw back to that episode. Yes, we where did. Where we did an we entire episode about. <laughs> an episode on Ted. Yep. So TED Talks are short, informational videos on any topic I think you could come up with. You could probably find something that would touch on it. Mm -hmm. um, they are done by all kinds of people, all walks of life, all experiences. Great way to bring a lot of voices in your classroom. So mm -hmm. it's always good. I, I guess I will say one other thing about this list is that for the most part, uh, with a couple of exceptions we'll talk about, these are all free resources. Like they're free to students, freely available to students and educators. I think the one that's on here that's not is Teachers Pay Teachers, but we'll talk about that because mm -hmm. um, that's kind of an interesting case too. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Well, I think that this part of our episode, oh, it really does happen a lot, but we're going to talk about the, the Green Brothers one more time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so YouTube channels, including... John Green and Hank Green. So their most famous one is Crash Course, which are the high-quality educational videos. They've produced more than 45 courses to date, 
And these videos accompany all kinds of high school and college level classes, and they can range from the humanities to the sciences. And the other thing that I love about Crash Course is that they tell it simply, but not in some sort of way that isn't accurate. And I think that's a hard thing to do. It's very hard to explain something simply without um, tearing from it at times. And I think they do a yeah. good job of that. Crash Course and, and then SciShow too, which is uh, another related to the Green Brothers production. But the, the SciShow is Hank, Hank Green and then a host of other people. Mm-hmm. And they also do it's science, news, history, particle physics, chemistry, biology, <laughs> psychology, yeah. all this stuff. I think with all of these, uh, with all of these content creation initiatives, the the goal is to bring people along with you when their attention spans might be dwindling, and that's a big teenagers. challenge. <laughs> yeah, teenagers, but also just like Chelsea. digital. Yeah, me, me, <laughs> my attention span not very long, but I think that that it is a real challenge. But it's also one that the internet is creating, right? Like the way that mm. social media specifically works, it, it's causing us to lose our attention spans and therefore it presents a challenge for content creators because they have to convey sometimes really complex ideas Uh in a way that is simple and accessible but not too dumbed down such that it's not useful information yeah so that is a challenge we we try to do something like that on the pod actually but uh Mm. on this podcast but it is um it's not easy to do all the time so i always appreciate when people execute it well Mm. Well, and I don't, Chelsea's probably going to tell me that this isn't something I should include here. Is Masterclass content? Yeah. yeah. Okay, because you watch that's a lot of- That's not paid. I mean, that's not free. That's paid. Yeah, but. you're right. But I was just thinking about uh, their like episodic nature. It can be very friendly for that type of learning as well. Because even though like we watched like 30 minutes of Chris Hatfield talking, I like thought for a minute I understood space travel. Yeah. I've never felt that way in my life. No. But, yeah. Chris Hadfield uh, explaining but, orbital mechanics yeah. in a way that actually made sense to us who have we have no idea about. Yeah. But I think that's one of the many gifts of masterclass is their ability to tell those stories. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. So moving on from the Green Brothers. Yeah. Yeah. We have one called How Stuff Works. Yeah. I've run across this one several times just looking things up because I like have. to know how things work. I do. Oh, is this the one that has the diagrams of like the... They, like, make diagrams of how things work. I'm not even kidding. I feel like I've seen a website that looks like this now that I'm uh, about it. I think you're probably thinking of how things work. Oh, that's what I'm thinking of. But Sorry. I, they do have things diagrams. Things and stuff really they threw me. Have, they do have diagrams of how... Okay. I mean, I, I when I was a kid, I think I had a... Is a book? Can you look this up? How things work? I, I think that's what's coming to my mind. There was, like, a picture... There was a picture on the front of the book cover of like this contraption. Yes. Okay. This is what I was thinking of. Yeah. You're exactly right. How oh, stuff works exists. and how things work. How things works is from Nat Geo Kids. Cool. Cool. I'll throw this in the link. I mean, National Geographic is another is another good content creation but place. It's, it's not all free all the time. Yeah. Okay. So how stuff works. Yeah. How stuff works is a educational website. They are interested in satiating curiosity and explaining the world around us. They say, you've got questions, we've got answers. Our team of know-it-alls isn't afraid of a challenge. Okay, very cute, but just an educational YouTube channel. Um, kind of interesting. Uh, there's another one here that our friend just told us about a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, this is a ger- originally a German channel, but it gets translated. It's called Korsgesagt, in a nutshell. Uh, it, it's it's like, in short, is how that is translated. But, uh-huh. like, in a nutshell is how they choose to translate it for the English-speaking audiences. But they do animation videos explaining things with optimistic nihilism. Uh, They are. Optimistic nihilism. (laughs) I like the combo. It works for me. If I had to describe my approach to the world, optimistic nihilism might be a good good way to describe it. That would be a good gamer tag. Optimistic nihilist. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is a good one. Uh-huh. That's um, that's really solid, actually. Yeah, yeah, but they do uh, they do animated videos. The animation style is really cool. It animated is. videos explaining things with optimistic nihilism. Team of illustrators, animators, and number crunchers, and one dog, which I thought was cute. They aim to spark curiosity about science and the world we live in. Nothing is boring if you tell a good story. So again, this is like, too. and several of these resources tend to combine entertainment with information and again that's part of holding people's attention you don't want to just show boring Mm -mm. videos we kind of talked about that our driver's ed episode how my driver's ed was just 
going into yeah. a dark, sad room and watching sad videos. Car crash videos. Boring mm-hmm. car crash yeah. videos. Anyway. Yeah. And then you mentioned this Edutopia, which today I learned yeah. that that was founded by George Lucas. I had no idea. And we've used a ton of their uh, sources yeah, in this you can, podcast. If you go, we always post our sources with our uh, shows uh, in the notes uh, on our website, on our personal website for oh. our podcast. On our content um, Our source. podcast's personal website. <laughs> uh, yeah, our content machine. We always post sources and you'll probably see uh, us linking to Edutopia articles and resources a lot. So so the foundation, the Edutopia Foundation, dedicated to transforming K-12 education so that all students can acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to thrive in their studies, careers, and adult lives. And like I said, it was founded by George Lucas, the, the filmmaker, in 1991, <laughs> uh, which I did not know before mm-hmm. today, which is kind of interesting. So, yeah. yeah, but we, but Edutopia is a good, Edutopia is more, um, it's not so much necessarily for students. It's, it's more for educators yeah. seeking useful content about how to be educators mm-hmm. and be better educators. They just have a lot of great topics to read about, too, which mm-hmm. is what I, we've kind of wound up in with them. I like their stuff. Yeah. Um, they have video so, content too, yeah. but mostly articles what I found in my, my searching. So a few more ways you can get some content. Content. There's some famous teachers on TikTok. Uh-huh. Uh, one of the ones I was talking about was Mr. Hamilton. Mm-hmm. I'll include his link. He was like one of the original COVID uh, teacher influencers. Obviously, Risha Allen from mm-hmm. episode 50 for us uh-huh. at Rish Dish Fish. Um, and somebody else that's on TikTok, but that also isn't just a TikToker, is a woman named Laura Randazzo. And she's basically the queen of secondary English classrooms. She's one of the top sold people on Teachers Pay Teachers. I think you're the queen of secondary English classrooms. I'll tell Laura to cut me a check. Yep. Laura Randazzo is on TikTok. She has her own personal website. We love a queen with a website. She's also, like I said, one of the most followed, liked all of that on Teachers Pay Teachers. And her content is just incredible. She has done such a good job of evolving just in the 10 years I've been following her. I go to her stuff all the time when I'm looking for like, if I get thrown a new class and just by chance, I'll usually start with her to say, okay, what unit plans does she have? Because I trust her as a starting point. And it is always, and I I know I'm paying for this content, but her Teachers Pay Teachers stuff is incredible. Yeah. Why don't you talk about, so what is Teachers Pay Teachers? Teachers Pay Teachers is a website that any, um, I guess anyone really, could sign up. We've definitely talked about it before. Yeah, on the to show. sell content for classrooms. <laughs> Websites, th- they'll sell like PDFs, they'll sell quizzes, they'll sell Google Slides. Like some of it's free, a lot of it's free. But it's a great place to start. Like I said, if I get a new class and I'm not sure what I want to teach, it's a good place. Mm-hmm. If I'm testing out a new book that I'm not super comfortable with and I'm not sure yet where I want to go with it. It's a great place to go to start looking through sources. Mm -hmm. Some are free, some are paid, things like that. But it's a way for for teachers to reach out to other teachers and kind of, like I said, it's all, it's a a marketplace too, but it's a way to pick the brains of all of the educator, all the other educators in the world Mm -hmm. so that you don't have to start from scratch with something when you encounter something new in the classroom. It's a good jumping off point for coming up with ideas for how to engage Mm -hmm. your own learners. And Teachers Pay Teachers in the last couple years has even started doing school subscriptions because so many teachers were using their own, I mean, I still use my own dollars for it sometimes, but like I said, it's, it's especially nice for me as an English teacher because I know I can trust her stuff. It's always quality. It's always worth my money. And it's a great starting point. So there are a lot of great teachers on Teachers Pay Teachers who can support that. But like I said, Laura is kind of a, she covers a couple of these things because she's got her own personal website where you can read like her essays and articles and things like that. She mm-hmm. sells on Teachers Pay Teachers and then her TikTok's really funny too. So yeah, she's kind of doing it all. So outside of outside of the Teachers Pay Teachers um, scenario, how do you use some of this content that we've talked about in your classroom? Like, how does it translate from being on the internet to yeah. being a part of your day-to-day teaching experience? Yeah, I teach Julius Caesar, mm-hmm. which 
my kids have gotten that history, but it was in middle school. Like the historical context of Rome. That, what was in a, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So Julius Caesar is a little bit complicated if you don't understand why everyone was just like, yeah, I him. I struggled with that too when we did it. I was like, okay, first of all, it's Shakespeare, so it's hard to read. Yeah. Second of all, it's from a period in history that we really haven't covered in great depth right. in school yet. Uh-huh. So there are all these nuances that you really have no access to yeah. until you have some of the access right. to the historical context. So uh, teaching Rome is not a simple thing. And I found a crash course video that did like a brief history of Rome. It's like 15 minutes long, talks about Romulus and Remus, and it goes through just Caesar Augustus and all he was going through. And then you got like the mythology background. Yeah, and it goes into Cleopatra and it comes back from Cleopatra. And then, you know, it gets a little iffy. But um, it's a great 15 minute video to set up for the chaos Mm -hmm. of what Rome is facing at the time of Caesar. And just to say how a government who's supposed to be operating under a triumvirate, right? A three-person leadership group, which is what our current United States government is set upon, is the three branches of government. The tripartite government. Right. Yeah. So we've got Rome struggling with a triumvirate, and then this dude Caesar is like, but wait... You know, and so, I mean, Caesar put up a statue of himself and called it the unconquerable God. Like, wow. this was a big thing for Rome to have to deal with. So that crash course video is so great because it pokes just enough fun at how ridiculous Caesar was to get my kids in the mindset to be like, we should find humor in how stupid he is at times because his Hamartia is so great. Right. Like, that's that's just one of the ways, though. Um, th- yeah, so I think that this is good. It's kind of a good point that you... So you use this as introductory material. Is it Hamartia or Hubris I wanted to use? I have no idea what Hamartia is. I think so. I wanted Hubris. Dang it. Oh, Fatal Fall. I was right. Hamartia? Hamartia. Hamartia? Hamartia? H-A. Hamartia. I don't know this word. It's Greek. How do you not know it? Uh, Wow. Hamartia, yeah, that's what I How wanted. How do you not know it? I actually don't know all of the Greek words, as well, it turns okay. out. You're always like... <laughs> Stop it. Hamartia. Hamartia, that was the word I wanted. Wow, one point for Katie. Wait. Oh. Okay. I mean, I suppose Brutus also is probably suffering suffering from Hamartia, but... Also, I mean... Hamartia? Are you saying T-I-A, like Sha? Yeah. Probably Tia. Hamartia. I've never heard it said like that. Dang it. Hold on. Yeah, Hamartia. Okay. That's why I didn't think it was Greek, because it sounded more like... Anyway. How am I still wrong? Hamartia. I've never heard that word said like that. Well, every professor has always said Hamartia. Well, that's probably because not every professor has a classical Greek training, but... Well, at my fancy <laughs> book school, <laughs> I was taught... <laughs> um. Anyway, Hamartia? That's his... He was a cocky son of a... Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like it. Let's keep it in. Anyways, the like I said, Crash Course is great for that, especially yeah. as an English teacher. It does a great job. I would imagine in a lot of other contexts, it would probably be great because they do like um, specific figures of scientists, historians, uh, historical people, um, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. So it, those Crash Courses are a cool way to do that. Mm-hmm. Um this week, my kids are going to be watching the Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie TED Talk, which is my favorite TED Talk, which is the danger of a single story. And it's a great way to introduce the Holocaust. Mm-hmm. Because what we do this week is we talk about what we know, what questions we have, the Americans' role in the Holocaust, and then we go straight into what's a single story and why is it so dangerous. Mm-hmm. So there's a TED Talk. There's content from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum that's free. So all of these things kind of come together to... To help support me, because I always, I always want support and for factual evidence. Like I always want to have the proof. Mm-hmm. So all of these things are just really great pieces of proof for me to convince my students that to, that it's important to speak from a place of having done your research and being able to support it, and not just blindly trusting something. Yeah, here's which the other- is why recently we just did a whole writing assignment on the dangers of thinking that Helen Keller couldn't have existed. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting how you're talking about the dangers of a single story here. I know you're talking about it in the context of the Holocaust education mm-hmm. and stuff like that, but it, there are also dangers of a single story even in providing content like this because people. But well, people think that there is because there's a 
tendency of people to think that when we use content like the content we're talking about, that that's it. That's the end of learning rather than the Mm-mm. very, very beginning it's of learning. The beginning. And I think a lot of this content that we've talked about today, content creation stuff has to, more to do with introductory. I mean, some of it gets really in depth, but a lot of it is there to introduce you to subjects. Mm-hmm. Like that's its explicit purpose is to make you aware of something, make you uh, maybe help you find an interest in something that you didn't know you were interested yeah. in. But it, in a lot of cases, these aren't meant to be the only thing you ever learn or hear about this. Because, oh no, I hope not. Yeah, but like we were talking about, it's it's a little hard to reduce complex topics down to bite-sized bits of info and to do that, to do it well, it really should get learners motivated to then go on and do more and do yeah. their own research and do their own learning. But the other thing I think is interesting, at least that I would think would be motivating for you as a classroom educator, is that introducing your kids to this kind of content shows them that other people are interested in this stuff. Mm-hmm. And that it's not just something they're being forced to learn in school and that these things actually have broad societal, yeah. cultural, historical impact, and that these are things that thinking people are concerned with. That's <laughs> that's always one of my goals, too, in sharing this kind of stuff, is be like, look at all of the stuff that we could be thinking about mm-hmm. and pondering and There's working toward. Look at the progress we could be making. So in addition to the just kind of here's the introduction to this topic, it's also like, look at this whole wide world of learning that is available to you mm-hmm. that you didn't know about before. So anyway, that was just kind of like one of my notes is because I've heard some criti- we talked about it in our TED Talks episode because some of the criticisms of this sort of content is that it's surface level and that it can be glosses over things or whatever. But I think a lot of that is because of the format and mm-hmm. because of our attention spans, but also because we're misunderstanding what the what this content is for. Yeah. And that's to be the beginning of learning rather mm-hmm. than the end of it. So anyway big fan of all of these resources have enjoyed many hours of some of them will continue to do so yeah. because it's just fun to learn agreed as i stated in my last my last podcast episode i do i do like to do the learning you do okay right. are we ready to move on to fill in the blank we haven't done it's, this in a it's in a been while. a minute <laughs> so, it was last year it was last but, um, year that episode, episode 72 driver's ed yeah what do you want do you want to uh i even included it in the show notes because i knew you would ask where it came from i i i sure did aren't you impressed i'm very impressed thank you episode 72 driver's ed okay the first state issued license plates were distributed in massachusetts in 1903 the very first plate featuring just the number one was issued to blank who was working with a highway commission and was the son of the famous ice king And we talked about that in the last Mm -hmm. episode. Go find out what that's all about. But one of his relatives still holds an active registration on the one plate. And that person's name was Frederick Tudor. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So fill in the blank. And this week's question, if you happen to know the answer, please go ahead, write into us. Hello at 16to1.com. That is our email address. We would love to hear from you. If you answer the question correctly, or even if you don't answer the question correctly and just want to say hi, reach out, send us an email. We will send you some 16to1 stickers. We would uh, love to hear from you all. So what is this week's question? The first YouTube video was uploaded on April 23rd, 2005 at 8.31 a.m. Wow. And featured a young man, Jawad Kareem, standing in front of two elephants at the San Diego Zoo. The 19-second video was filmed by his friend, Jakob Lipitsky, and has since amassed more than 271 million views. What was the name of the first YouTube video? That's fun. So 2005. Yeah. Goodness gracious. So here's another little fun tidbit. Currently, the most watched video on YouTube is Baby Shark Dance by the Pink Fong Kids, Songs and Stories. Wow. Wow. And it has 11.54 billion views. And that ought to be in your head forever and ever, and you're welcome. That's upsetting. I will say, I, I looked at a few lists just to be like, That's you know. the most watched one? Yes. Interesting. I would not have guessed that. Well, think about it. Kids just turn it on and it never stops. I suppose so. But I would lose my mind. It wow. was really interesting because of like the top 20, like probably 10 were kids' songs. Wow. There's like Coco Melon and stuff like this. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's such an interesting phenomenon. I will say kids, kids love YouTube. Yeah, kids love YouTube. They also love what I've discovered. This is just from our friends who have kids. They love to just turn on a Disney movie and watch it 400,000 times in a row. It's just like I'm that way too. Holy crap. And I mean, 
Yeah, we as adults do this because we watch our favorite TV shows over and over again because it's comforting to dwell in the familiarity of our favorite shows. Like, it's just pleasant sometimes mm-hmm. to know what's coming. Like, I rewatch comfort shows yeah. over and over again, but that is like an extreme. That, But that's that's 11.54 mm-hmm. billion, billion views. views. On yeah. ba- that's the baby shark dude, dude that one? Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. 11.54 billion Incredible. Times. That video has been played. How long does a YouTube video have to play for it to be counted as a play, like as a view? I really don't know. That's a good question. I wonder if it's a percentage of the I length. should know that. I yeah, don't you know. Should. Okay. I do not know. I'm going to have to can find you, out. Can you learn that for next episode? I will episode? learn that for next week. Okay, thank you. For next episode. Yep. All right. Are we ready to share with our listeners what you learned in the last couple of weeks over break? Mm-hmm. All right. We always share what we learned. This is one of my favorite mm-hmm. things. We get to do a little bit of... Sharing of our hobbies and traditions and things that we are interested in and books we're reading and all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. So what did you learn? Um, just a recap. Not what I learned. We watched Wednesday. Very cute. Mm-hmm. I started Daisy Jones in the six. Um, I'm on a quest to finish at least 25 books this year, which feels low, but I don't hey, want to start it. on a failure. Yes. I'll give you stickers. When Thank you. you. Pizza? Finish. Yeah, pizza. I mean, pizza at the end. I think those are the highlights. Those are like the most recent things we've been kind of into. We've watched some very odd and disturbing documentaries on Netflix. Oh, yeah. I, I learned a lot include. about Mount Everest, and I also learned a lot about New volcanoes. Yeah. Who's New Zealand? A volcano off the coast of New Zealand. Hakar. I'll never be able to I say don't it like they the name do. of it. Okay. Anyways. It was upsetting. But active volcanoes are dangerous. That's, that's the moral of the story. Oh. Some people apparently did not know that. Yeah. Okay. So actually... This just happened as I was at work uh-huh. today. I'd never heard of this. So this okay. is like fresh. Very fresh. So I heard about, I learned about a guy named C. Keith Connors. He uses PhD. And so today I was filling out an ETR form, which is the evaluation team report. And it's the initial set step for identifying a disability. And then determining the appropriate educational needs of an identified student. Gotcha. So we have um, an IEP meeting coming up for this student. And And IEP means? Individualized education program. Okay. And so those can be students with um, all kinds of disabilities could receive an IEP. Okay, so I'm working on filling out the paperwork for this ETR and the IEP and all the acronyms. And I get an email of a form and it's something new. It's called the Connors 4. Okay. Not no an I- acronym, though. No. Amazing. Okay. No idea what Connor's for was. Opened up the PDF, printed it. It's like 90-some questions about the way that a student acts in my class and if I see it a lot, a little, never. Okay. Something like that. Hmm. So I was like, what is this? And where did this guy come from? So, see, Keith Connors had an insane career, actually. He was a clinician, a researcher, a lecturer, an author, an editor-in-chief, and an administrator. And he was dedicated to studying ADHD and other childhood problems too, but uh, really, really focused on ADHD. Um, So from that work, he has published books, journal articles, chapters based on his research and other childhood disorders other than just ADHD. He's highly recognized in the field of psychology for his contributions, and he was the recipient for the Lifetime Achievement Award from both the Association for Children and Adults with Attention Deficit and Hyperactivity Disorder and the Mental Health Research Association. Huh. And so the PDF I was filling out came from um, some of his work on helping to identify concerns and issues of student behavior and things like that in a classroom. Not to quantify the student, but just to kind of give some context for what we experience with them. Yeah. And like I said, it was like three pages. It was mostly just a list of things that you just, like I said, had to rate as how often you saw it or didn't yeah. see it. And then at the end, you got to write in what you think the kid does really well, what this you is, think they need. That's super interesting. I sort of wish that resources like this were actually packaged in a way that were that was more accessible for parents. Because I've even, like, I've been wondering about talking about my own parents about this because I've been, as many of us have been, inundated with social media that is telling me that I have insane ADHD, which I probably do, because I have all of these behaviors and my mind does all of these things that are all on all of these rubrics, right? Like, mm-hmm. the basically, like, I did not know until somewhat recently 
that these things that I did that I thought were just weird, quirky things, like forgetting why I walked into a room, but like all the time, not just like every once in a while. <laughs> and like, you know, just, just the weird behaviors and little things that I do, all of that kind of stacks up. But what it, what, this whole process of even asking questions about this has prompted me to do is go learn a little bit more about things like ADHD. And what I learned was that I'm like, oh, I've been doing these things for forever. <laughs> like, did nobody when I was in school think to be like, maybe we should test this kid for some for some of this stuff because I just have gotten to a point in my adult life where I'm like oh that's actually a coping mechanism for ADHD but I've done it since I was like six mm -hmm. uh did no one know and the, the answer usually, the answer usually is yeah nobody knew because we don't inform people of these sorts of things like they're not widely talked about no. in our culture I and mean, they're becoming more so I think social media actually is fueling a kind of resurgence of and i mean there's a, also of course backlash to it as well because there are a bunch of people who are now like i have all these things and people are like well how do you know the internet told you but the thing is for me is that it's just helped me discover ways to address some of the things that frustrate me about my own life um so that's how i look at it is like a way to have a set of tools that i didn't have available to me before so mm -hmm. anyway uh resources like this one that you're talking about i think would be very interesting for for parents to become aware of, to help their kids, to help them be able to help their kids navigate some of this stuff earlier and with a better chance of doing something helpful mm -hmm. um, to help address some of these things mm -hmm. uh, earlier in our educational careers. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. So I have their IEP meeting in a few weeks and I'm curious to see how that, curious to see how this uh, will will play a part in the conversation. Mm -hmm. so. Did your did your school just decide to start using this, or is uh, it like somebody went to a PD and they I were like, know. "I found this thing." I'm trying to. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, that's part of the follow up I want to do as well. Yeah. But this uh, worksheet, when I got it, it felt like a worksheet. Listen to me. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking. I was like, "Oh my goodness!" And then as I started reading it, I was like, "Oh okay." And you can tell it's definitely. Um, it's written with the idea that it'll be a much younger student than mine mm, that you mm -hmm. fill it out for. Cause it's things like um, stand at their desk when they shouldn't be. And yeah. not that my teenagers like don't do that. And, yeah. Right, right. Or, you know, things like that. Um, you could tell it's definitely written for a little bit younger audience, but I think it, I think it would still work. Cause like I said, sometimes my teacher, my teenagers just won't, you know, put their butts where they need to be. So <laughs> true, it's like that. True, true, true. So anyways, I, interesting to read about this. See Keith Connors guy. Probably gonna have to look into some of his books. I'm just I'm just sort of interested in him now. So, and like I said after the after the meeting, I'll report on how we use that information because I'm just I'm curious to see what we do with it. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not often that an educator gets handed something that feels like a whole bunch of work, and then you do it, and you're like, well, that was worthwhile because mm -hmm. that's not always the case. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's very true. That was kind of rewarding. Yeah. All right. So, what did you learn? <laughs> oh, I so I I finished. The one book that I was reading, uh, Internet for the People, which was very interesting but not satisfying to me because I wanted to hear more about it, it was the book is about kind of explaining the history of the Internet and also kind of how we ended up in this soup of giant monopolies kind of controlling our online discourse. But it went all the way back to the very foundations of the internet and like DARPANET. We talked about that some um, mm -hmm. in our previous episode. But so I was reading it. I finished that book and that was very interesting. Um, and then I started another book uh, called The Innovation Stack, which is not the sort of book that I normally read because I think business books are generally boring, or at least the ones that I had known of and read, tried to read. <laughs> I don't, but I, but I'm trying to learn more about business like I don't actually know a lot about I know a lot about technology but I don't know as much about running an actual business so I'm trying to learn about running a business and I asked my dad who is a very accomplished businessman I was like is there a book about business that will help me learn about running a business that will not bore me to tears if I read it and he sent me this one called the innovation stack by Jim McKelvey um that name might be familiar. He's an American businessman, co-founder of Block, mm -hmm. uh, which is the payments processing, those little dongles that you stick in your phones and swipe credit cards. That's Block. And so he started that company, co-founded it with Jack Dorsey. Oh, is that the Square thing? Yeah. 
Oh. And so, you know, I always read these books with a grain of salt because I'm... I'm just skeptical about a lot of things that I read, I suppose I should say. So, like, I take everything with a grain of salt. But this particular one is very interesting. I'm only a little bit through it so far. But this guy, Jim McKelvey, is telling the story of the founding of Block. And he was actually, he had a glass blowing studio. I just read that. Yeah. That's why I was like, he was what like am I an accomplished at? glass yeah. blower artist. Like, that's what he did. And then he was just like, actually, I'm just going to go start a company with Jack Dorsey. And uh, they didn't really know what they were going to do at the time. They were just like, we like working together. Let's start a company together. And they kind of like locked themselves in a space and brainstormed for a couple of days. And they hired an intern or like an employee, maybe not an intern. They hired an employee before they even knew what they were going to be doing like what the company was going to be and then they were like okay we really need to know what we're gonna have this employee do when he gets here next week and at the last possible minute this this guy jim mckelvey he had a friend who was also a glass blower and the guy he was like experiencing homelessness at certain times he was like living out of his car and a lot of it happened because um the glass blowing industry that they were both working in at the time, a lot of the transactions were cash only. Mm-hmm. And so this customer came to, to Jim McKelvey's store and the customer wanted to buy a piece of art. And it's one that the guy had been trying to sell for a really long time. And the customer only had an Amex and the store did not take Amex. They only took Visa and MasterCard and he lost the sale. And then his, his, this other friend, the guy, the other guy too had been losing a great, deal of sales and so he used his friend the glassblower as this kind of model for the customer that they (laughs) were going to try to reach and anyway long story very long story short the the problem they decided to try to solve was credit card processing Mm -hmm. and basically making credit card processing way less complicated and able to be distilled down into a way that his friend who was living out of his beat up car could use to support himself like how do we Mm -hmm. enable people like this to be able to sell their art so that was the problem they were all trying to solve and what i actually learned that kind of blew my mind and i even showed you this chart this like chart of pyramids that was basically what i'm about to learn but what i learned at the time and i'll just read it the quote from from it it's here's what he wrote credit card vendors were and this is a while ago now but credit card vendors were making 0.04 cents on every dollar they processed from their large merchants. So these are like billion dollar companies. Now compare this to 1.8 cents on the dollar, the profit they were making on small merchants. Their profit margin from small businesses was 45 times higher than from billion dollar corporations. I rechecked my math three times before that number sunk in. Small business, small businesses pay 45 times more than the giants do. We had identified a big problem and a good reason to start a company. Which when I read it, it really did not make a whole lot of sense to me. Why <laughs> why small businesses who do far less, you know, I, I think it's probably about the sales volume. If I had to guess, they're making, they're decided to charge more on the small businesses because the volume of those transactions is so much higher. But this inverted pyramid where the small businesses are getting screwed over basically mm-hmm. became the foundation of the entire company that we now yeah. know as Block. So that's what I learned. I thought that was pretty interesting. That is. Uh, The kind of idea here is to come up with, like I said, he calls it an innovation stack, but it's basically just like a set of problems and ways and solutions that address a unique need in the market. And that need of how do we help all of these small businesses become more financially stable and independent is is a really interesting one to solve. So. Nice. That's what I learned. It's interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. That was. Uh. But the book, the book itself, the rest of it, there's a lot of somewhat dry business facts and figures. But the guy's kind of entertaining. Uh, he tells some interesting stories. So gonna get try to get through the rest of that book cool. soon. That's on my reading goal list. That'll probably be the first one that goes on my little bookshelf. Yeah. That I'm gonna try to can't wait to code. Anything else? No, I think that probably about wraps it up for me. We're looking forward to the year on the pod. We've got some interesting um, guests potentially coming onto the show. We'll keep mm-hmm. you informed about that. Mm-hmm. Some good topics and episodes coming up. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for sticking with us. This is year three. 
This is it. This is when it starts. We started, didn't we start in January? I think we did. I think we started in January 2020. This is year four. No. 2020, 2021, No, we've not been doing this for three years already, have we? We started it in 2020. Oh, I can't remember. What we did it all of the 2020 years, <laughs> all of 21, all of 22. We're starting 23. Did I like delete a year from my mental timeline or something? I guess I did. Our first episode like came out right before the... COVID? I thought so. I said year three in a previous podcast. I need to fix that. Am I unable to count? Yeah, we started January 1, 2020. Wow. Okay, I miscounted my years. That's incredible. So this is year four we've been doing. <laughs> We're into year four now, not into year three. Whatever, whenever we I just said that. We over. This is the beginning of year four. Yeah. It, you know what it is? It's because I don't understand the start of years and counting that as a year. That's what I, my brain got all confused. Oh. So we've been doing this for three years now. Yeah. That's kind of incredible. So mm-hmm. welcome to year four. It says a... Uh, of 16 to 1. Who knows? <laughs> you know? <laughs> who knows what year? I think, I think someday... This podcast will be hilarious, if not for the fact that we have sat down to do this twice a month during maybe the foremost chaotic years of yes. human existence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, since I'm going to go back to like, I don't know, asteroids hitting the earth. It's been a minute. <laughs> it's been a minute since the world experienced this much chaos this intensely and rapidly. But uh, I suppose probably World War II wouldn't classify. I, I'm, I'm, I'm you think we're living in the most uncertain time since World War II? Right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You heard it here first, folks. Ooh, maybe don't quote me on it. Uh, I'm having second guesses. I get to edit the podcast. I can't imagine that the 60s and 70s were this unquestionable. I, I don't know. I mean, our parents are just like, oh, yeah, it was great. Economic stability. Everybody could buy a house. Upward mobility. Eggs were six That's cents. That's a thing we had. Cars were $5. Wow. It was great. Okay. Well, sorry that I lost track of what year it actually is and when we started the podcast, but this is our, we're going into our really fourth year now. Off the pod. Yeah, I have to quit now because I no longer know <laughs> anything about anything. But thank you for sticking with us. We just really have a good time. Uh, and we're, we looking, we're looking forward to 2023. And 24, who knows? <laughs> I went through a reckoning this year, remember? How many times we count on our fingers? How many years yeah, I've been teaching? Yeah, you can remember how many years you've been teaching. I can't remember how many years we've been doing the pod. It's a lot in both cases, so good for I us. I bet if we listen to episode one, I said what year I was in, so we should just use that as our, oh, as our, our barometer. Okay, cool. All right, well, thank you. We will talk to you in two weeks. In four years. In four years. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>